So I made a video kind of talking about why I don't like hosting stuff on VMs and VPSs. And I don't think a lot of people really understand my perspective of where I'm coming from and, and why I think there's a lot of extra overhead trying to run your stuff on a VM. First of all, how do you get your stuff deployed to a VM? How do you do feature releases? How do you make sure that you don't have downtime when you deploy those changes? These are things that you have to think about. And if you just have a small side project, maybe it's fine to have like a single VM and you can just SSH into it and like do your little git pull, pull in your changes from GitHub, do a PM2 reload, and basically have that launch the newest version of your code. But most of the stuff I talk about on my channel come from a perspective of like legit software engineering. I'm not talking about like a side project that you're trying to host somewhere. I'm talking about you actually have a client who's paying you tons of money to fund your team of software engineers to get something done. And so I'm gonna take you back to 2015 when I worked on a project that tried to do microservices and micro UI. So how microservices kind of work, we had various microservices. So I'll do circles for the actual services. And then we had UIs that were kind of related to those. So I'll say a student's UI. And we had a couple of these, right? So we had one for security. We had a security UI. And we also had a security service. We had like a portal UI, which is actually a component. So this is like a, a React component or an Angular JS at the time component that was kind of loaded in um, into all these UIs. So we had a common place that like could drop down and people can navigate between these different UIs as needed. So a user might come in, they might load up, for example, UI number one, and then they would kind of use this portal. They would click a button, have the portal widget drop down, and they click on a link, and that would figure out how to redirect them to a different UI like this. Now, depending on the permissions, obviously a security UI would probably only be for like admins, but there's a bunch of different other UIs and services that existed in our system. Okay, I'll just do a dot, dot, dot to make this kind of apparent. Where basically a user would kind of navigate between these and all these services kind of had their own database or maybe they kind of were responsible for a subset of the data that was in a larger database. Now, I don't know if we actually did microservices correctly. Again, this is more like when I started coding and I wasn't really sure what the heck was going on. So I'm assuming there's some stuff that was done wrong back in that time, but, but I think we're trying our best to get on that microservices hype train, and that's kind of the approach that we ended up taking. So the talk in this video is why I don't like messing with VMs. Okay, so let's zoom in. I'm going to zoom in onto one of these services. How do you get this API deployed somewhere? So if someone came in and you said, hey, you know what? You can only have four EC2 instances. You got to get this service running on these, and we'll give you more if you ask for more, but we're not going to auto-scale anything for you. We're not going to give you some way to basically auto provision this stuff for you. How would you do this? Okay, well, first of all, you probably use some type of orchestration management tool, right? There's a lot out there. There's something called Puppet. There's something called Ansible. There's Chef. I think there's something called Pulumi or something. I don't know. But at our job, we use something called Puppet. So before I dive into how Puppet works, I do want to talk about there's a push mechanism for basically getting these changes onto these boxes. And there's a pull mechanism. Puppet uses a pull mechanism. So basically Puppet Master has like all of your scripts to find and when these machines come online, you have to set them up with like a Puppet agent runner. That's going to phone home to the Puppet Master server and say, hey, what do I need to install in this box? And it basically grabs a script, it runs that script, and then after it's done running, it'll have whatever you needed to install there. Okay, so that's a pull mechanism for basically orchestration. Ansible and Chef basically have a, a push. So somewhere you have a server and it's going to basically contact these machines and it's going to push changes. It's going to run shell scripts and CLI commands on these machines so that they get set up. So first of all, I had to deal with Puppet, which I didn't like. It was, it was a lot of work to basically figure out how to get these Puppet scripts written properly. I had to have VirtualBox running that had like the same type of image that we're using over here. And I had to kind of like run a bunch of commands to simulate what would happen if I ran this Puppet script on this machine. Does it get set up correctly? So it was a lot of work, right? A lot of stuff to learn. All right, so after you have all these instances set up with Puppet Master, you kind of configure them with whatever name it needs to set up. Um, it's going to pull its changes and it's going to run through the script and it has to install your service. So in our case, it's going to install version 100 for all these things. All right, so let's talk about how do we do a version update? How does this service even get deployed here to begin with, right? I haven't even talked about how do you get these things on here? So in our project, there's a couple of additional things I need to talk about. First of all, there's something called Jenkins. If you haven't had the opportunity to work with Jenkins, I am very happy for you because I hated it. There's stuff out there like GitHub Actions, Circle CI, Travis CI. Those are all CI CD pipeline tools. Jenkins is basically a roll your own, like you host it in your own VMs. You get it set up, you create like a Jenkins master, you create all these Jenkins agents, runners, 
where if you need to have some type of CI CD build script, you go ahead and you, you know, have that running one of your Jenkins agents, or maybe you have multiple agents that need to run for your single like build pipeline. So Jenkins is a, a CI CD pipeline tool. And how we get a new version deployed down here is that a developer would take some code, maybe they tag their Git repo. And what would happen is that Jenkins would basically hook in to GitHub and it would say, you know what? I just saw some new changes get merged to master and it's gonna go ahead and pull those changes in. And that's gonna run a series of workflows to basically build your project, test your project, make sure everything is good. And at some point, if everything is good, after running all those checks on a Jenkins agent, you're gonna to have to basically create something called an RPM, right? So an .RPM file, I think it stands for Red Hat Package Manager file. And in our case, you have to create some type of thing, like a zip file kind of, where you have to store that somewhere. So in our case, we'll say Artifactory. This is basically a place where you can store various artifacts. So if you're using like Java, um, you have to basically upload jars there or war files. Basically, it's a way to store a versioned thing of your program, right? So if you're trying to set up a new version for your service down here, you basically build a new version for it. You bundle it in RPM, you store it in Artifactory. But I think the way we have it set up is that all these machines are configured to pull you know, maybe patch versions or minor versions of whatever this RPM was. And you basically need to have these things re-trigger to pull the configuration. And at some point they're gonna pull in those RPMs and okay? those RPMs get pulled in. And the RPM itself, you have to basically write a bunch of scripts to say what happens when the RPM runs. In our case, you basically had to stop the PM2 server. And then you had to delete the old code. And then you had to take all of the code that was associated with your service and put it in a directory. Maybe you had to set up various binaries on the machine as well so that the service would work. And then once that is all unbundled, you'd have version 1.0.1 on the machine. And then you basically have the RPM do a PM2 reload to have the service reload itself. And now you have the new version of your code. So now that you just basically stopped the service and reloaded a new one, you just occurred some downtime for this one box here. So you need to make sure that you didn't do that all at the same time, because if you do it all at the same time, you're going to have downtime for any user trying to update these. So you kind of want to do them one at a time. You slowly update them. And again, leave a comment. This is like from a long time ago. I don't really remember all the mechanics of how we did this. But basically, at some point, all these would slowly update to the new versions. And all your users would be using the, the newest version. So now it gets even more tricky, because we were using something called console as our registry service. I think it's called a discovery service, discovery, discovery service. So console is another tool that's created by HashiCorp where basically as these services are coming online, they phone home to this centralized place to say, you know what, I'm this service X, this is my version number, and this is the IP address that I'm living on, or this is my subdomain, or this is my whatever. You can kind of store some metadata related to these services. And the reason this was useful is because these other services might need to contact your service. And so if your services over here, for some reason, needed to phone home to this security service, well, they would just go ahead and ask console, hey, where does this service live? It'll get a, a domain or an IP, and they can start doing a request directly to this service. So based on my fuzzy memory, that's kind of how it all happened. That's how like we did this. We got this all set up, and this is something I would never want to do again. There's so much time spent into making sure that everyone understands how this whole thing works. There's just so many moving pieces. I would even call this like over-engineering, but again, at the time, there weren't as many like Vercels out there. You couldn't just, you couldn't just point it to your Git repo and have everything just deployed automatically on serverless. I don't even think serverless was that big at the time either. So running on EC2 instances was like the de facto standard. I think we're still transitioning from like bare metal data centers into the cloud at the time. So you still kind of had to do this stuff. You had to basically package your RPMs and have them spin up on your dedicated machines. Luckily now for everyone who's watching this video, like this might be way over your head. You might say this is insane. But again, there was no Vercel. <laughs> there was no like... AWS Elastic Beanstalk where you point it to a Git repo and it just figures out how to deploy everything. There was no Netlify. This is like the main reason why I probably would never want to ever touch a VM again 
is because I wasted so much time and had so much frustration having to learn all this stuff that honestly is just like a giant um, time sink. Anyway, I kind of touched on a bunch of different topics on this video. I hope you guys learned something new by watching this. And if you are more experienced than I, and you've kind of experienced something similar in the industry, leave a comment, let me know. Let me know this wasn't some weird one-off project that was just over-engineered. I'm curious if other companies are kind of doing stuff similar. And there's probably something that I didn't explain 100% accurately. Again, it's been such a long time. But that's kind of what I remembered, and it was a mess. Anyway, if you guys like watching, give me a thumbs up, comment, subscribe, press the bell icon, and like always, I have a Discord channel. You guys are welcome to join if you want to find a place to hang out and talk to some other developers. Have a good day, and happy coding.